Hello everyone. Today's topic is early management of head injury. This will, this will be the first uh, topic of discussion for PiyushMalik.com. I am Dr. Piyush Malik. I am speaking from Dubai. Alright, so early management of head injury is important because the due course of injury outcome or overall outcome depends on much of the factors on early management okay we all agree to this now is there a best way to manage head injury are there something new I am going to speak uh, a better concept or, 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 or uh, a better way of management something new it's uh, yet to be there in, in, uh, in the evidence what is this impact apnea will address the most important thing knowing impact apnea is that why this young and healthy who had got a hit in his head died when they uh, did the CT scan uh, they did not find anything and the autopsy report comes out to be negative for anything why, why they are dropping dead what is this impact apnea now this presentation has something for everybody the first topic presentation as I as I said uh, it is from junior doctors to the super experts they will find something new now use of ultrasound in a resource limited area like India uh, or somewhere in the world where that is, CT scan is a dream or MRI is is, is, is difficult to get so uh, can ultrasound replace those extensive I mean expensive modality uh, in some way uh, that is we'll talk about optic nerve seat diameter by ultrasound and transcranial Doppler by ultrasound how they are going to help in managing these cases finally what are the things that work in head injury what are the things you should do in head injury patient to have a good outcome right so you can do it today I mean you can learn it today and use it tomorrow let's go to the epidemiology do we have any data in this part of the world like India or even Gulf we don't have any data in US like most of the data are available from there they say in a hundred thousand population 823 gets injury some kind of injury into their head or brain during one period one year uh, duration within that period out of this suppose 85,000 uh, uh, patients get seen in an emergency department 10% uh, are of head injury now that comes out to be uh, around uh, 85,000 right uh, sorry 8,500 8, head injury patients so among this uh, 5,100 patients will discharge safely from uh, emergency department 20 will require neurosurgery 220 patients will require CT scan and they will be there will be 100 and 1700 admissions so what it, this number means that it involves significant cost and 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 uh, the the initial uh, management reduces secondary brain injury like you know uh, so basically it's all about managing early in a better way saves life there is no confusion about that then uh, let's go to the the third slide how do we get it and what is the mechanism of injury so you know if you if they include the child the pediatric age group falls becomes the highest number of cause of causing head injury then road traffic accidents assault blunt or penetrating trauma associated injuries alcohol abuse and getting injury so these are the some of the 
causes of head injury we all know that that is no uh, no brainer now this slide is very important we all know that we have to know glasgow coma scale and it is a slide you should uh, see it uh, uh, giving a pause and uh, you should memorize and you know why i'm brought up this slide is a neurosurgeon a neurologist a emergency physician if they do separately the same patient's gcs they write a different number that means we do not memorize or apply the glasgow coma scale properly so this is i just recommend everybody to review it our brain is not accustomed to memorize so many things so it is not a bad idea there are in studies published in it that you don't remember glasgow coma scale well so it's a point to review it again now when we will admit a patient in the hospital so things are getting clearer now a patient with suspicion or evidence of head injury you will admit them when their gcs is below 15 even 14 you will admit a patient of head injury amnesia neurological symptoms a clinical evidence of any skull fracture extracranial injuries are too much a uh, mechanism of injury uh, is not trivial. Uh, I mean, somebody in that same car has died, and this patient is is fully awake, but there is there is a concern that he might have a, uh, a, a severe injury. So, uh, you know, uh, if there is an uncertainty, uh, even in the social factors, you will admit a patient. The next slide, this slide is very important. These are the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the area when you see some kind of abnormality, we get worried. I mean, uh, be careful and that this patient, this slides means that there might be chance of <coughs> fracture base of the skull. So what are these? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Periorbital bruising, subconjunctival hemorrhage, CSF rhinorrhea or rotoria, epistaxis, hemotympanum or the behind the ear battle sign. So these are all it can indicate that there might be a chance of base of the skull fracture. All right, now let's go to types of head injury. How many types? So we divide into two types, primary injury, which has already occurred. We cannot prevent it. This is a job of our political systems and awareness and you know public health. So this is it. So this it, it's going to get better only when there is a preventive measures put in place. What we are dealing the early management of head injury patients over here is secondary head injury. So uh, what what we should do for this secondary head injury? Now, if managed, uh, 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 I mean. Uh, uh, what we are doing here, the aim here is to prevent secondary brain injury. Primary has already happened. Early management prevents secondary brain injury. So what do we do for uh, reducing uh, secondary injuries or we do, uh, how do we manage gen uh, generally in the past and even, even presently, how do, we do, how do we manage these uh, head injury patients? We give manitum. Some people say we give hypertonic saline, this is better, that is better, all right. So some people say it's, there is a severe uh, head injury with diffuse brain edema, they do decompressive craniectomy. Uh, some people they, uh, put ICU bolt so that they can categorically manage the uh, pressure of the intracranial pressure uh, regularly. Used to do hyperventilations, but now no more uh, it is... Uh, recommended hyperventilation probably bad some centers they do barbiturate coma uh, so you know burst operation and all those things so that the electrical activity is taken energy that is around 40 percent of the brain metabolic rate has been suppressed steroids is not uh, given nowadays and anti seizures medications this is what we all have right what do you think that which all these measures 
which we have just spoken has class 1 evidence of any benefit? Can you guess? The answer is none. Zero. None of the intervention which I have just uh, spoken or just seen work as a class 1 evidence. So what are you doing? Where are we? Probably things that work are common sense. We do not need rocket science for head injury. Now things that definitely works in head injury patients are good oxygenation. A good blood pressure means a little bit higher than uh, 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 normal blood pressure. Head up position, normal cardio, and usual once the patient reaches high dependency area to or ICU, you do those bundles, you know, CBP bundles, back bundles. These are the you know definite things that works in head injury patients. Now we said hyperventilation is bad. That has been proven. So that means a decade or two back, all those patients, those who are getting hyperventilated, had a injury which was uh, which was which was aggravated by hyperventilation by severe vasoconstriction of the cerebral circulation. So that is not more uh, in, uh, no more uh, recommended. So you keep the CO2 limit to 35 to 45, which is normal. Now something new has come up is hyperoxia is bad. Is it true? Now, now some of the retrospective studies, those who came out from therapeutic hypothermia modality of treatment, when they keep, when they kept their uh, 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 PCO2 level above, I mean hyperoxia level of 300, uh, uh, they did all have bad outcome. So what does that mean? So when the injured brain has uh, has 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 a, some uh, now uh, uh, activities are going on, oxygen producing free radicals puts fire, I mean puts petrol on that fire. So probably this is the uh, simple way I can describe. Now hyperoxia is bad. So what does that mean? That means you do not want to see 100% saturation on your monitor in any of your head injury patient. Be mindful. 100% oxygen and a saturation probe in a monitor, it might be 300 millimeter of mercury, the PO2 in the blood, it might be 600, it might be 150. So probably 97 is, is around you would like to keep. So what should be our aim to keep the PO2, do a busy, a simple blood gas analysis and keep their uh, PO2 less than 300. So there is ample of studies. I am going to link it uh, to the show notes and you can follow those. So PO2 of more than 300 probably bad, not bad, it's very bad. And PCO2 of less than 30 millimeter of mercury is bad. You would, you would like to keep normal cardia, normal carbia and normal oxygen saturation. Probably 97, 98 is fine. Now, head injury patient has come. When to decide that you are going to intubate? Very clear. Everybody knows when GCS is 9 or 8, it's a severe head injury patient, you have to intubate. Now, second point where we get misguided, it's all about clinical sense. That if you think that your patient's GCS is 12 and he is not looking good, you are presuming that the patient is going to get deteriorated then you better intubate now rather than having a problem later on hypoxia and hypotension even once in even in ED emergency department has been linked to bad outcome. Now how do how do you do uh, 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 their management? Now CT scan is the gold standard stuff you diagnose it should be done as soon as possible okay you find extradural, subdural, they go in surgical pathway, call a neurosurgeon and do the need food. Difficult decision for intractable <coughs> uh, ICP with diffuse injury are the patients, those who need proper attention. Now decompressive craniectomy, the decratile did not show any uh, benefit. So that does not mean 
that you should not be doing it. It all depends on case to case basis. It is your neurosurgeon who should decide it. Uh, a good neurosurgeon still have uh, a, a, there are a lot of loopholes in the uh, studies and 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 uh, you should be carefully taking this piece of information that the complicit craniectomy is bad. Probably it is bad it cho if chosen uh, uh, in a wrong places. So what else uh, in new uh, what el what else we can do in a limited resources uh, kind of situation or places like India when the CT scan is not there? Can optic nerve seed diameter? by simple ultrasound method, uh, replace a CT scan? Probably answer is no, but something is better than nothing. Ultrasound way of doing optic nerve seat diameter correlates well with intracranial hypertension. So when the optic nerve seat diameter becomes dilated, I mean the CSF pressure goes high, so there is a value, it is 5.8, there is also controversy among this value, I just simple simplifying uh, uh, simplifying it after studying so many papers that 5.8 millimeter is the diameter of optic nerve seat cut up if it is higher than that you are dealing with intracranial hypertension transcranial doppler is a newer way of doing intracranial uh, compliance monitoring so it does help us showing the blood flow previously uh, uh, there was a lot of problem with the older uh, transcranial Doppler uh, monitors. Now the point of care ultrasound has a very very high resolution probes which can be done even for adults. So there is no uh, uh, doubt that it is going to help. It's a matter of time. So everybody those who are there in resource limited uh, places should know, uh, uh, do transcranial Doppler even in the higher centers. Uh, in, 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 in the time to time examination, you can do multiple time, non-invasive, you do not have to take the patients to anywhere. These two investigations are, are uh, linking very well to the intracranial uh, blood flow pattern. So these are the things you should do to diagnose. Now let's manage it. How do we manage ICP? There are four steps I am going to uh, speak in this podcast. So how do you really manage head injury is that tire zero. You do basic things, basic, uh, basic stuff clear, head up position, normal temperature and sugar and you keep that, uh, you know, uh, PCO2 and PO2 at the recommended uh, range we, we, uh, we just uh, uh, described. One more or, or point we always forget is control of that pain. If pain is there, there are a lot of activities uh, will I mean the stress response and sympathetic response you do not so the uh, addressing a pain in adequate manner helps a lot sedating uh, a intubated patient I just wanted to uh, uh, point out a small thing a quick neuro examination before you intubate is very very important you just do a quick uh, neural examination painful stimuli opening eyes or not verbal commands are so basically you will have uh, a good idea because once the patient is intubated uh, then then it's uh, difficult to assess a proper uh, GCS or Glasgow coma scale so it is a must thing now what is this is the tire zero management what is tire one you go for those osmotic therapies hypertonic saline mannitol and some people they have used sodium bicarb. I will link all those details of when to use what in the show notes. You can get into this link and, and go ahead with a further reading. Now this is the tire one. Now let's go to tire two. ICP management. Now you do those uh, uh, you know ultrasound stuff or bolt or intracranial. Uh, you know you manage uh, their ICP by propofol or phenobarb drip. Uh, and you take uh, basically aim is to produce the the electrical activities which is responsible for 40 percent of the brain uh, basal metabolic rate you sh are trying to suppress those I mean even if it is not first suppression you are decreasing the 
the, the uh, injured area's metabolic rate and you will optimize the cerebral perfusion by giving uh, propofol, all right, by keeping that, of course, hemodynamics well. Now, now tire 3 is decompressive, still the pressures are high, uh, each time you will try to uh, uh, monitor the intracranial pressure, uh, either you have those uh, uh, CT scan, intracranial bolt, uh, transcranial Doppler or optic, uh, no, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to have some kind of uh, uh, follow up and some kind of investigation to uh, follow these kind of patients. So, zero tire, first tire, second tire, now we are going to, still the ICP is not optimized, you go for decompressive craniectomy. Some people they go for induced hypothermia and uh, the results are equivocal. Barbiturates, we know that barbiturates coma and moderate hyperventilation in, at the time of impending herniation or some people they say the cone. All right, so what is tire 4 then? It's all these measures failed. Now tire 4 is the thing which is absolutely new, a very new concept of compartment syndrome. Head is a compartment, okay. Our body is consists of many interconnected compartments. So compartment syndrome of the brain equals to ICP rise. That means, uh, I will give you a small concept, you know. Suppose you have a compartment syndrome of a patient in his cuff, then you know the surgeon, it opens the calf as well as the thighs. So these compartments are linked, all right. So you open one compartment, you, you, you decrease that pressure or release the pressure from that compartment, the other compartment which is linked in our body, what I mean to say, thigh is linked to abdomen, abdomen is linked to chest, and chest is linked to head. So if you can open the chest or abdomen, then I see should fall. There is very nice article which I am going to uh, post it along with this podcast. You can all these uh, all, all of you can go through this, and they have wonderful, promising result. I am not saying open up your all head injuries patients, those who are having diffuse brain edema and you know axonal injuries, uh, 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 chest and abdomen should be open. But these are some of the modality which is come up with a newer and promising results and uh, you can have a look onto it very and, 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 and uh, carefully. Now ketamine in head injury, we all know that ketamine is contraindicated. Please go to a posted video in the website, probably it's the biggest myth, probably, probably it is the best drug in hypertensive crossing head injury patient. You do not want one thing to happen is hypotension in brain injury patient or head injury patient. So these are the articles you can uh, you can copy it and see it right now that there are so many evidence that ketamine is probably the best agent and rather it uh, it, it decreases and or optimizes the cerebral perfusion pressure which is which matters the most. All right. So these are few articles for you to read it and now the. The, the, the best and new thing which is which I am going to speak is uh, impact apnea. If you know it, very well. Now, have you ever thought a young patient died after a trivial head injury and CT scan showed no pathology. He just stopped breathing and became hypoxic and there was a cardiac arrest. Now, why did this happen? Now, impact apnea, the initial concussion the method, the mechanism has been understood and uh, two UK physicians have hypothesized that this is probably due to catecholamine surge. Brain stem goes to a reset mode like you know you are re resetting your iPad like you know for some time for a few seconds or a minute depending upon the severity of energy delivered to that head injured patient it goes into some kind of reset mode or arrest mode. So basically his heart keeps on beating, he stops breathing. So hypoxia and uh, uh, causes all this pathological. So maintaining airway and giving some positive pressure, just holding the mask 
if the patient stops breathing, probably is the solution for this. Of course, intubation and all those things are definitely there. But this is this is impact apnea. Brain does not uh, does not get much of injury, but it goes into a reset mode and you st uh, the patient stops breathing and dies. So this is impact apnea, and it is coming into literature more and more uh, after the understanding of uh, impact apnea, which happens in the head injury patient. Simple management: you maintain their airway, assure their uh, oxygenation, you are done. So optic nerve seat diameter. It's basically, as I said, it is one of those uh, repeatable point of care uh, examination which is very, very helpful uh, in head injury patient management. You are giving manitol. What is your end point? You do not have both. You, you, you have to see that what was the optic noxid diameter before and after, after 24 hours. Is it increasing or is it decreasing or it's remaining same? So, you know, along with transcranial Doppler, uh, evidence is not strong strong but impending herniation gross midline seat brain death newer you know uh, uh, machines are coming with a better resolution so you can have a fair idea that what is happening especially if you do not want to take your patient every 24 hour to CT scan uh, to do a you know a scanning and see what is happening so these are can be a ancillary or you know additional test to have a better idea Thank you very much. Hope uh, uh, this uh, podcast stuff uh, should work. I'm very hopeful and, uh, mm, and uh, hope to talk to you soon.